Perfect. All right, got it. 11.31, we're gonna start on time, end on time. Welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you here for our Brunch and Learn. Um, yes, you are in the right spot. It's a Brunch and Learn and we figured given the current business environment where nothing really is as it was before, why not host our learning event differently? So we wanted to um, try out an earlier time and do an express version of content um, and I think today it's really about encouraging us to think differently about the challenges that we're facing. So we are mixing morning cocktails, um, day drinking, <laughs> and KPIs to serve you up some thoughtful content that's really delivered in a more relaxing but efficient setting of 30 minutes. So we're going to be in and out very quickly. So just consider us your content mixologists. Uh, I got Mackenzie here. She's our producer. <laughs> and Eileen. Uh, Eileen is going to be my co-host today for our very first ever Brunch and Learn. So Eileen, what do you think about day drinking? Well, I feel like I shouldn't put that on a recorded webinar, but obviously a fan. So super excited about today. Um, but Emily, your, your time optimist bottleneck is getting in the way. So I want us to get started and get back on track. And let's, why don't we introduce ourselves and share a little bit about why we're here today. Awesome. And we are recording, yes? Yes, we're recording. So hi everyone, I'm Eileen. I'm obviously one of your co-hosts today. I'm the community and education lead here at Delegate Solutions, which means I lead the department that houses our delegation training and coaching services. Um, having once managed our service department, which has about 40 virtual executive assistants, I definitely understand the importance of selecting clear KPIs and then training those responsible for those measurables on what they mean and how they can impact um, the company as a result. So super excited to share that with you today. When I'm not thinking about KPIs or delegation training or day drinking on the job, um, I love brunching with my family of four in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, especially if we don't have soccer games and busy dance rehearsal schedules to cart off to. Um, and when I do get that chance to sit down and enjoy a brunch, I love a good vegetarian scream bowl or hash, and of course, a delicious mimosa. What about you, Emily? Oh, yeah. I'm a vegetarian too, so I'm with you on that part. Um, you know, day drinking, I got 50 remote employees, so say no more. Mimosas <laughs> are the really the breakfast drink of champions, but sometimes I'll actually mix it up with coffee and Baileys just for efficiency. But um, in case we don't know each other, my name's Emily. I am a chronic time optimist. I'm also the founder and CEO here at Delegate Solutions. And over the last 15 years, I've had teams and teams of non-C-level employees that we've managed remotely. And KPIs really are at the heart of running a, any remote team because at the end of the day, it's really about the outcomes produced by the team that you actually can't see in the office each day. And making sure that that outcome is clear and measurable is sort of what we're here to talk about. So whether you're running an in-office team or you're actually remote like us, um, you will definitely have some great takeaways that you can implement with your teams today. But in terms of brunch, since we're on the topic, um, I'm also a vegetarian, so I love uh, like bougie French toast and pancakes, fresh fruit and hash browns. So not to get us off track, but um, Eileen, bring us on to the presentation. Yeah, bougie French toast sounds really good right now. Um, and while I know many of you are in the office and can't necessarily enjoy a yummy brunch right now or even day drink with a mimosa, um, we definitely want to make this a little more fun. So every time you hear us say KPI, take a sip of whatever beverage you have on hand. Um, and we'll see how that plays out for Emily and I as we continue to <laughs> enjoy our beverages. Since we're drinking mimosas, we do encourage you to grab a drink along with us, um, whether it's wa water, coffee, or something else more fun. So Mackenzie, let's take a quick poll and see what everyone is drinking this morning. Ooh, water, I know many of you are in the office, so you don't get to have as much fun as we're having this morning. Um, well, that's okay, again, Take a sip every time. Oh, someone is drinking green juice. I threw that in the pool as like a joke. That's awesome. I love it. Um, okay, we're going to get us back on track. We're going to focus on why we're here today to talk about all things 
mimosas, just kidding, metrics. Um, so please send any questions you have around um, KPIs or anything we shared today. Um, you can put those in the chat window if you'd like, and we will do our best to answer those throughout today's session. And of course, we'll try, we'll definitely leave time to answer any lingering questions at the end. All right, so let's get started, Emily. Awesome. So whatever you're doing to stay awake and hydrated today, we definitely support your choices. So let's dig into some content. So the late, great Peter Drucker famously preached that what gets measured gets improved. And the trick is really to understand the value of that data and be measuring the right things and using those things to inform your decisions. So if we agree with this philosophy and we agree that numbers keep everybody moving in the same direction, we know that the majority of revenue being generated by the front lines is really contributing to the bulk of the bottom line of the business. Eileen and I asked ourselves, why aren't we talking about measurables for this group? Everything that's put out is all about measuring different departments within the company, measuring the effectiveness of the C-level team. But what about um, our, our non-C-suite people? So we wanted to encourage you today to embrace the idea that everyone has a number. So traditionally, when we think about metrics, we're always focused on C-levels like executives, managers, directors, but there's so many other people in your organization that want to stand up and move the needle if only given the opportunity. So if we go deeper down within the levels of the accountability chart, we can look at key metrics for the front line of your business and getting those fully optimized can actually dramatically improve so many parts of your business. Yes, I totally love that point. I think leaders really miss that opportunity to fully, um, as you put it, optimize their team to see a real impact and, and setting KPIs is the perfect way to do that. So before we dig into specific examples of these measurables, um, Emily, I'm curious from your perspective, what do we need to think about to ensure we're selecting the right ones each time for our C-level or non-C-level members? Yeah, so that's a perfect question. And that's where we're gonna start this morning because some of the best practices um, need to be considered before we actually look at the KPIs that we're going to recommend. So Eileen and I are gonna run you through just a couple of um, best practices that can keep you set up for success before you even look at what the KPIs are. So the first um, thing you really want to think about is what is the ability that they have to influence the metric that you're setting for them? So this, this can be one of the biggest mistakes if we don't get this right, because it can really lead to the team getting demoralized. Um, you're forcing accountability on something they can't actually change, influence, or impact. And they're also likely not used to being held to measurables like this. So make sure that they are part of the conversation to set the metrics that you have in place and make sure they're clear on how they can actually impact the results of the metrics that they're set, that they're set to. Um, and so one of the things that we do is a quarterly state of the company, and that is um, a practice that we use where we present where we've been, where we're at, where we're going as a leadership team. Um, and this really helps inform the team around what is going on at the company level and how that can be drilled down to them. So at the very end of that talk, one of the things that we do is mail out a, since we're virtual, we love to incorporate like tactical things into how we're working with the team, like tangible things that they can hold and look at. So we mail out a postcard um, size thing that actually lists out the three things that they can focus on for the quarter. And that really helps them remember and stay focused on where they're gonna make the most impact. Yeah, and I love those postcards that we get in the mail each quarter, because not only does it really show how our team can influence the business, but I think it also helps to get helps us all get clear on what the success criteria are for that quarter, what it looks like as a team. And that's another great KPI best practice to define success and agree how you're going to measure it. Um, Let's be real. Um, most of us are not mind readers. And if we were, we wouldn't even be on today's webinar. Um, but we are and we're here. And since we can't read minds, um, we should assume others that we work with can't either. So that's why it's really important when you're selecting a KPI to explain what success looks like. So while we're applying this to these metrics, these KPIs, this is also a delegation best practice that we implement regularly here at Delegate. The more, um, the reality is, is the more vague the measurable is, 
the less likely we are to achieve it. So you want to paint a really clear picture about what it looks like and then have a conversation with the team member to share that these things have to be true in order for this metric to be on track. Yep. And then the next thing you want to think about is why hitting these KPIs will positively impact the organization overall. So think big picture. So just like we teach with delegation, it's always important that the team understands the why of the KPI and how their work fits into the bigger picture. So tying it back to state of the company, pulling in metrics that you know feed up to each other. That's really part of what to think about when you're thinking about um, picking metrics for non-C-level staff. I couldn't agree more. And, and when they understand the impact, um, then they can, we can make that even more powerful by tying it, their KPIs to individual and company goals and priorities. We call them rock, but if we can tie it in there, that makes all the difference. And if I'm being honest, the most of the time, the only goal that I can set for myself is just simply remembering what day of the week it is. And I failed earlier and thought today was Wednesday. So not doing well on that goal. Um, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that, right? We have so much happening, so many things going on day to day. So it is important to set those goals. We know they're crucial. And if you can set goals and priorities that tie to an individual or company goal, the non-C-level team member is going to really appreciate that clarity and the potential impact that they can have as a result. So for executive assistance, as an example, they innately love to help people. It's what motivates them. And honestly, it's the number one thing we look for when we are hiring for those roles. Um, and if you can identify metrics that have to do with the goals you or the company are trying to achieve, then they're gonna gravita gravitate towards helping you chase that goal down. Um, they will appreciate your restraint around chasing shiny objects. And if they have metrics tied to the goals you're trying to hit, they can help you stay accountable and on track. Yes. And the last one is really to encourage delegation whenever possible. So of course, loving delegation, this is my favorite one to talk about, but I believe that an organization that is constantly elevating their whole team will exceed all of their impact goals faster than they can even forecast. So encouraging delegation from day one sets the tone that you value efficiency and autonomy and setting metrics across the company around maybe hours um, shed off people's plates so that they can focus on their most impactful contribution is really going to set the overall tone that you value um, the impact that they're there to make. So we're going to keep flying through this content because we are already at 1144 and we have a bunch more to get through. So the, the first thing that we want to talk about is most impactful contribution. And this is the concept that I teach in the first chapter of my delegation book, Let It Go. But it applies here when we talk about KPIs and measurables, because really one of the biggest roadblocks that we see leaders face with delegation is that they are totally not aware or connected to what impact they're trying to make and the perceived value of their time. So anytime you can work with your team or yourself to reframe your thoughts around how your time is really set up to create an impact. You know, I believe we're all here to make an impact that only we can make regardless of whether you're a CEO or you are um, in the front lines on the ground serving clients. As companies grow and work piles up, it's very easy to just get so busy that we lose touch with what we wanted to spend our time on and why. Um, and it, then we get really disconnected from the impact that we're trying to make and we can get stuck there. So being able to overcome this and unpack this creates this lens where we can see the things that we're doing and spending our time on that are not impactful. But let's like bring this back to reality. It's like a very big concept. So Eileen, tell me a little bit about what is your most impactful contribution as an example. Yeah, so my most impactful contribution is teaching and training others. And I get to do that by teaching business leaders and their teams how to embrace delegation as a part of their culture. Um, that's what I aim to do each and every day, and I absolutely love it. However, if you were to talk to my kids, they would tell you it's to be a human school bus and cart them around um, at their whim. So, you know, we've got some differing opinions there, um, but both are important to pay attention to. And I think the more clarity I have for what I see as my most impactful contribution, the more I can really target my actions to sure I'm contributing to what only I can. Right. Perfect. And so mine is really about connecting, 
creating, collaborating, and learning. So pretty much what, exactly what I'm doing here today. So with that in mind, keep, you know, most impactful contribution, that's the foundation around where delegation and where I think measurables stem from. Um, let's review what measurables you can actually implement in your team. So Eileen, let's go through the 10 measurables that could be relevant for all of our non-C-level members. Great. Um, and Emily, I don't know if your mimosa is getting to you, but can you advance the slides? <laughs> <They're> not. <laughs> They are. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> we shouldn't have started drinking before the webinar. <laughs> um, so once you have clarity on your most impactful contribution and that of your non-C-level team members, then that's when the magic really starts to happen. So we're going to share some very specific metrics that you can think about um, for those non-C-level people in your lives. Um, and hopefully this will help make their most impactful contribution a reality as well. So the first one you see on your screen is one, it's all the pet peeve of mine. I really hate when people are not responsive or take forever to turn around a task or a project. Um, I'm sure you all can, yeah, who's with me on that one? Um, it bugs me to, to no end. So I know it's important to solve, but you also have to kind of address it with a little bit of caution. I've seen companies kind of come and go that want to track responsiveness of their employee turnaround time. And if you're a company that has a culture of responsiveness, or if you're seeing challenges with employee turnaround, then this is a great KPI to consider. So you want to identify and agree on the ideal response time and have people track how quickly they're handling those responses. But this is where the caution needs to come into place. I absolutely love, and I'm saying that with sarcasm, the companies that say they want team members to respond within an hour. And I've definitely seen it at Delegate with some of the clients we work with. And it is the most unrealistic metric possible. Um, if we are all responding that quickly, we're not getting anything else done. We're tied to our computers. We're not being productive in other ways. Um, and so you really need to be more realistic about this particular KPI and how you're approaching it. So for example, a delegate, we set the expectation that our team is responsive at least three times across the business day with each of their clients. So if you wanna use that example, then you just need to think about what responsiveness looks like for your team and define it with your team so that they can track it appropriately. Um, we've worked to determine with our team whether responsiveness is a simple, I got it, or it's a more fully thought out response each time we're responding to a client. Yep. And so number two is prepared and preparedness. So this one can be a little bit subjective if we don't really tee it up properly. So it's important when you're talking about a metric such as this, that you set up the time to establish the parameters for what success looks like with this metric. So time is money and it's more valuable than ever. And there's nothing worse than going to a meeting or an event where the person leading it is not prepared, right? So we all sort of are trying to find ways to get out of meetings. Last thing we want is to go in there and we're not organized. So one of the metrics that you can set for your non-C-level team um, is to maybe enact a meeting score. So like when the meeting is over, um, how prepared was the person leading it? So you can score that um, one to 10, for example. So what does being prepared look like? Let me give you a few examples that you could use as you set up a metric like this. Did we start and end on time? Was the scorecard updated on time? Was it accurate? Did they have what they needed to actually have an effective conversation? Or was it like we spun our wheels and we got nowhere because the person wasn't prepared? Um, did they accomplish their assigned to-dos from last week? That's something that we track in all of our meetings. What are the outcomes and the to-dos after all the conversation? making sure that those are getting to done um, each and every week. So that is the second KPI we'd recommend is how prepared people are for meetings. The next one is productivity. And I'm definitely the kind of person that is determined to use each minute of my day as efficiently as possible. I mean, it means I'm absolutely exhausted at the end of each day, but being productive drives me. And I'm sure you have non-C-level team members who will also be driven by this type of KPI. So this is a great metric if you're looking to improve efficiency. Um, and what I really suggest doing is selecting a part of your business or a system that you're looking to optimize and measure efficiency there. Measure it at the start and end of the quarter with sort of incremental hours saved each week to build to your ultimate goal. 
um, you can track a total use utilization goal each quarter, which is what we do. And then you track more granularly on, I can't say that word apparently, granular, okay. On where the numbers need to be each week by each person in order to reach your overall quarterly goal. It's really a game changer to think about it that way. Granularly. Granularly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, number four, process documentation. So what percentage of your processes are documented? Oh my God, this one is so important, right? Process is the backbone of our companies. Yet sometimes this like becomes one of those things where like, ah, when we have time, we'll get to it. Trust me. I recently went into the back end of my business and nearly had a heart attack because of what I found back there <laughs> uh, in terms of what had not been fully documented. So this can be really terrifying, especially if you're working really hard to delegate. Like imagine you're investing all this time to train someone and you're so excited. You've cleared these things off your plate and it's been so long that you don't even recall how to do the thing anymore, right? Because you've delegated it, they've automated it. You know that it's happening. Well, imagine you wake up and that person's gone. <laughs> so now there's this key system or activity that is critically important to the day-to-day -day operations of your business. And so, and now the person is gone, who knows how to do it? So in our delegation training, we teach that one of the five golden rules of delegation is committing to the boring stuff because it is the backbone of your business. So at a minimum, when you're working on this sort of metric, you wanna make sure that the work that you've delegated off your plate to someone else is actually captured as a process. If it's repeatable, you just turn it into a process. Um, you can have it video recorded, you can have it transcribed, you can have it in a in process street, Asana, whatever you name it, but make sure it's in your possession. And so one of the things that you can do with a metric like this is to identify what the key processes are and agree to capture a certain percentage of them week over week. Yeah. That's, that's a great advice. And um, this next slide, I probably really should not be the one sharing this example because I am terrible with a budget. And as my husband will tell you, I just spend it all. Um, I don't pay attention. Um, I'm curious what this group's but, um, budget philosophy is. Uh, Mackenzie, if you can throw a poll in, I'm curious to see how this, this group um, approaches this. Um, and I should say, I'm not good with my own budget. I'm great with others. So I'm not like spending delegate money like left and right. But this is a great measurable to kind of to keep um, in budget. If you are someone who wants to increase your bottom line, which I would assume most of us are in our businesses, um, this is your aim then to bring your team into the budget. Empower them with financial education around the flow of money in the business and how they can impact it. You really want to speak to the why, why it's important. And then set a measurable, measurable for them to say, keep within 100 um, percent of their projects or expenses um, in a bud in their budget each week and then just kind of track away from there. Uh, we have a lot of penny pinchers in the group. I'm going to need them to walk me through that um, <laughs> at some point, but this is I'm, great. I'm looking at this and my answer, which is not my problem, ask the CFO, is like barely anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know guys, but that's how I think about it. Um, yes, that is a perfect one. So 11.54, we're going quick because we wanna get you out of here on time. But remember, we will be staying after for Q&A if you have specific questions. So number six, keeping goals and rocks on track. So I love this one. Um, if you have an exact, like let's say the visionary or the CEO that needs to be wrangled and focused, let this non-level, uh, non-C-level support person own keeping the leader on track with their rocks. So they can incorporate this into their weekly planning meetings. They can have um, proactive conversations around what progress is happening on the rock, making sure that they're actually going to hit them on time, um, finding delegations in there, and then reporting back to their supervisor each week um, percentage of rocks or goals that they're helping to keep on track. And of course, you want to see 100% here, but it's a creative way to think about, you know, double impact. Absolutely. Um, in this next one, I am the kind of person who thrives on efficiency. I want to solve the world's problems in like 30 minutes. I don't want to waste time and energy. I want to work smarter, not harder. So this is a great KPI to improve efficiency and decrease time that's spent on tasks. So reward your team um, for finding ways to get their work done faster and more efficiently. I love a little competition with this one in particular. 
um, give them the autonomy to find ways to automate or delegate some of their work, and then set reoccurring tasks. So you can estimate time spent at the beginning of the quarter and then track pro progress across the quarter as a result. Perfect. Number eight, dollars served from forecasted expenses. So same principle applies to um, the budget comment that uh, Eileen was sharing about, but a team focused on cutting costs, especially as we're looking ahead at you know tough times um, and understanding how they can do it is really a needle mover. So I've seen this happen in my own company at Delegate, but helping your team focus on a part of the budget that they can influence. So maybe that's printing costs or mail costs, um, and giving them some sort of measurable around cost savings. You can gamify it and make it fun with prizes so that it directly hits their pockets too um, if they can get that measurable done. So I teach people how to delegate. And if I didn't delegate myself, I'd probably be a hypocrite. And I can't stress the importance enough of considering making this delegation a KPI for your team, um, especially if they have work they hate or don't enjoy doing, or maybe there's someone else who could do it better or it could be automated. There has to be some other way to solve that particular work. Um, so per percentage of work delegated is a great goal to think about in terms of hours or by responsibilities. Um, you could set a company goal for the year that where everyone has to identify a segment of their seat that can be automated or delegated. And for management level team members who might really be resistant to letting go and, and are probably also hitting the ceiling at the same time, you could have them identify five hours of work per week that they can hand off to others or they can automate. And that can have a massive impact for the company. Um, or if you're trying to get someone moved out of a seat, uh, you could uh, use this measurable to kind of track the handoff of their work as they're moving into a new role. So it has a lot of great advantages in that respect. Yes, and you can even create ghost seats on your accountability chart as you start to identify more work going into um, maybe a new seat for a new hire that you need to make. Number 10, last uh, KPI, hours freed up per week. So in our bonus content that we'll share um, at the end of this recording or when we send out the recording, we're going to share a um, document that you can use. It's an exercise that you can run with some of your employees to help figure out how to free up their time. But um, in this example, this KPI can go many ways. So you can take your support team members and say, set a goal for them to free up five hours per week for the leader that they're supporting. Or you can have key team members set a goal to free up 20% of their time each quarter by identifying um, non-impactful work and trying to get it off their plate. So this is just a creative way to save the company money and increase your impact overall using measurables and delegation. I love that one. Um, so I saw someone ask about how to track these KPIs um, earlier in the presentation, but once you have those metrics selected, then you need to track them. So we love a good scorecard at Delegate Solutions as a visual way for our team to see whether our metrics are on track or off track. And I know Mackenzie just threw a poll in because I'm curious how else you all are tracking your metrics at the moment. But using the scorecard, if the metric is red below the um, standard we expect, then the alarm bells are going to go off for us. And we're going to look at how we address that particular issue, um, that off-track KPI, and ensure we get it back on track as quickly as humanly possible. And so your non-C-level team members will definitely appreciate this sort of visual aid of their progress. Um, and I think it also removes kind of the emotion that's tied to conversations when something is off track, because numbers don't lie. And it's definitely a more objective approach to reviewing those measurables. And when we do need to address something coming that's off track, we'll do that in a weekly meeting and discuss what's working versus what's not, um, and then determine a solution to get it back on track from there. Oh, Emily, you're muted. Oops, sorry. I was gonna <laughs> say building the feedback into that weekly meeting is one of the cornerstones that we teach um, just in delegation as a whole. But I see that no one chose sticky note, which is very disappointing <laughs> to hear. But I'm glad to see that most people are, you know, tracking them online or using Excel, which is awesome. So we flew through the content. We are getting you out on time. We are so excited about that. 
And our mission on these brunch and learns is to drop knowledge that leaves you better off than when you came in this morning. So in addition to the learning that we shared, we have three other goodies for you um, that will come to you in the email. And I think Mackenzie might be dropping links for some of this and she's looking at me like maybe she's not. So either way, you'll get it in the email if it's not being dropped right now. Um, but the first bonus piece is the elevated week. So that's the exercise you can use with teams you need to optimize and really create a plan that helps move people to a more impactful um, role. And then the second thing is this entire talk wrapped up in a beautiful download that you can reference and come back to. And Eileen is going to bring us home with number three. Yeah, so the last um, item I want to mention is that if you liked learning from us today, we really encourage you to check out more of our training content. Um, as an attendee for today's webinar, we're offering you a special promotion of 50% off our delegation e-course that we call Elevation Quarter. And we call it that because we really do believe it takes a whole quarter to kind of really build the habits around delegation and a lot of the best practices and tools we share should be revisited on a quarterly basis in order to really help you um, bring your delegation strategies to light and you can use these kpis today as a way to think about delegation so um our our next offerings are in April they start April 13th and 18th depending on which offering works best for you but again you'll receive 50% um, off for being a participant in today's webinar and you'll just use the code KPI um, to access that discount. Yes, love that. Okay, we're two minutes over. So our takeaway for modifications for next Brunch and Learn is faster drinking and faster talking. <laughs> and we are staying on um, to answer any questions that are still remaining, but thank you so much for coming. We'll send the recording out and we hope you had a good time and learned something fun from us this morning. Mackenzie, what do we got? All right, well, uh, I can hear you. Did... Can you hear me now? No? Oh, okay. there you are. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. I feel like that commercial. Maybe we've all been drinking a little bit too much. Um, so first question was from Libby and Eileen, you did touch on it a little bit about how do you measure as a team when we talked about we do scorecards and tracking. Um, and did you, Emily, did you talk about how we track it? Did you touch on how, cause they're asking, how are they, is it done via spreadsheets or do we do an online platform? Yes. So we are old school and we use, um, Google sheets, which is basically an online version of Excel that updates in real time. But I can also highly recommend a tool like Bloom Growth, uh, formerly known as Traction Tools. That's a great way to track measurables as well. Awesome. And do you have a process for tracking what you send um, in our newsletters on the postcard um, that, for our team? Do I have a process on how we send? Um, for tracking what we send, like not for like actual sending, but you know, we send out the three bullet points of everything that the team is focusing on and how do you track that if it's if those three metrics are being completed. Yeah, so we use um, a internal software called grow.com. Um, and what that does is pull in measurables from all different tools and technologies that we allow our team to, or, you know, that's sort of what fuels all of the data collection on our team. Um, but at the state of the company, we talk about what the three things are to focus on for the quarter. If there's a certain metric that would be living inside of Grow, and at that point, the team can focus on um, what they're seeing and the managers supporting them can as well. Eileen, did you have anything to add to that? Sorry. No, I think you hit on the key components that I would have, so. Yeah, grow.com, grow I think it is. Yeah. Um, how do we communicate and stay on top of KPIs when Colby scores may indicate a lower follow through with the score? Mm, Colby. <laughs> I know those lower follow through scores are definitely hard, but I think that's why having like a scorecard or a visual that everyone's responsible for week over week and maintaining is important. And then making sure it's like on your agenda for each weekly check-in call that you're revisiting it. So if someone doesn't have a strong follow through, eventually they're going to get the hint that I've, I've got to come prepared with the, with this data um, to explain why it's on or off track. Um, set using different project management tools as well to remind them each week with a task is helpful. Like we love Asana. So there's definitely some different ways to kind of ensure that you're, you're each week 
that metric and that KPI isn't getting lost in the mix. Um, Emily, I don't know if you'd add anything to that. I would. So I would argue someone that has a low follow through might actually thrive with having a number because it's a motivator and it's a really clear visual of how, you know, it's not a subjective um, solution, which is why we wanted to talk about this today because you know, you want to be careful. You don't set subjective things. You want to make sure they understand how they're making an impact. But, you know, like we take a sales team member, right? They usually will have a lower follow through, but they will thrive with a metrics environment. And so one of the things you can do on your scorecard is make sure they own putting that number in each week. And so they have to actually speak to it in the meeting on track, off track. How are they doing with that measurable? And I think like assigning them the to do as a critical thing they have to get done each week um, shouldn't really be impacted by their Colby score because it's simply something they have to get done every week. That would be my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more little thing to think about is aside from those scorecards and the people who thrive with numbers, not everybody thrives with numbers, um, <laughs> me. <laughs> so how else can you hold people accountable to their KPIs? Like besides just saying, here's a number you got to hit it. What else can you do to help keep them accountable and wanting to push for that? I mean, I think it's built into a weekly meeting. That's the number one thing that we would want to be recommending is that in your weekly meeting, you're reviewing if the measurable is on or off track. When we're working with clients, we host those weekly planning calls. So you know, our team has to show up and report in on different metrics that we're tracking. So to me, like letting it drag out and, and not really building it into the way that you're working on the regular is probably the wrong way to think about it. So looking at it week over week, trying to break down a goal into what needs to happen within a week to hit that goal is another way to think about how you're picking the metric. And we touch on that a little bit in elevation quarter, even with delegation, how you can take a delegation and turn it into something more measurable. Yeah, and I think it's, sorry. No, sorry, I, I'll just say the other thing, I think too, the reason sometimes people don't graph those numbers, they just don't understand the why and how it impacts the bigger picture. So they think it's just, oh, another thing I have to check off or another requirement, but if they can really understand how it moves the needle for the company, if you can paint that picture and the success criteria, they're gonna feel more alignment with it. And um, that I think can make all the difference as well in terms of, how they're chasing that number down. Yep. Yeah, and Damon had a good point that it can be subjective. And I think it can be if you don't define it mm -hmm. um, with what it is. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why at Delegate we use the words on track, off track. What does off track mean? What does on track mean? Mm -hmm. um, so defining what it is so that it's not so subjective and that everybody in the meeting will understand it's off track if it's on track if. Yeah. Uh, I'm more I'm more nervous when a number keeps staying off track for a long period of time because yeah. what we've been taught is then the number's wrong or the person's wrong. <laughs> so, you know, teaching them why it's important. We touched on that in the beginning as you're setting the KPIs is important, making sure that they can actually influence it. And then I think the third part is, is it the right number? And sometimes it might not be. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so someone is looking to align their C-level members with their lower level managers surrounding the metrics and KPIs. So what or how can the metrics cascade throughout the whole organization? Yeah, so a good example of this one is the cash flow drivers. So we run on EOS and one of my favorite tools within the EOS toolbox is this concept called the, the cash flow drivers. And what that is is like, all the different things that contribute to cash flow in the business. So money in versus money out. And so on the leadership level, we set what are the cash flow drivers and then who owns each component of the cash flow driver. And so like, let's say, you know, we sell hours currently. So we're selling hundred hours a month, 200 hours a month. The service team is allowed to lose a certain number of hours per month so that we have our net number of total hours net new for the month. Right. So that's one example of how you can take a larger leadership number, which would be net hours, and cascade it down through different departments that will own different pieces that contribute up to that net hours number. Is that helpful? <laughs> Hopefully. I think it made sense. It's an amazing tool. It's literally one of my favorite tools is because it helps us um, you know, really keep track of 
what is the overall flow of money in and out of the business and who is directly influencing it and then cascading that down into a metric by department. Mm -hmm. That's all the questions we have right now. Okay. Um, if you have any other questions, we're happy to stay on and answer those. But otherwise, it was so fun to hang out with everyone this morning. Thank you for being here. We hope you enjoyed our upgraded format for these brunch and learns. Um, we're trying to have fun and teach cool stuff at the same time and just enjoy being, being there to help you through navigating all of this crazy times. Um, the recording will be sent later this afternoon in an email along with all of the bonus content that we shared. So great to see everybody. We're going to be doing these probably quarterly. So if you have other questions, um, please send them over to us via email. But thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>